thank you for coming today. Um, so you guys know uh, Dave Stobley, I'm the MD here at the security practice. Um, this slide is more about positioning why you may want to give me a bit of your time this morning just to listen. Um, I've got extensive experience across public and private sector, and I've been in this um, industry for over 22 years where I've uh, had a primary focus on security testing and incident response, and I've um, dealt with, not caused, uh, a, a huge number of uh, incidents over the years, some high profile incidents that you will have heard a few of them that end up in the press, but the majority of the work that I've been involved in, we've managed to actually keep it away from coming public and I think that's always a good sign of when you've done a, a really good job of helping an organisation through um, a particular pain. Um, today we will be touching on some real life case studies as well. Um, I'd like to talk about things that have actually happened rather than, than hypotheticals and I look forward to your questions uh, later on. Um, day job now uh, with Seven Elements as part of the Red Centric group. Uh, we are responsible for all of the cyber activity that uh, is is undertaken um, by the group, um, but we provide it through an independent um, business unit so we can actually uh, critique and complement technology that's been deployed and, and managed by, by Red Centric because we're not responsible for that part of, of the business. And Tom, who's one of my um, principal consultants, is part of, he heads up the resilience team. We've also got a uh, assurance team which focuses primarily on the security testing, penetration testing, red teaming, the actual hacking end of the uh, the, the spectrum when we're looking at cyber. And we have a uh, defence side of the, the business which is looking at uh, more of the managed services, so uh, monitoring, uh, managed threat response, instrument response and all of those good things that we, we look at there. So if there's anything you ever want to ask me about, just uh, drop me a line and we'll happily have a conversation. So today's agenda, um, we'll do a quick uh, introduction. We're going to look at the, the, the cyber threat landscape. We'll then move it and, and start looking more at ransomware and the threat landscape as it currently um, manifests within the UK and, and globally. I'm then going to walk you through a real life incident um, that we managed for, for a client and that will be under the co complex ransomware attack part of this presentation. We'll then move more importantly into mitigation. You know, what can we do? Um, proactively to try and avoid some of this coming to to, to bite. But more importantly, um, if if it does and we've got all the controls in place correctly, then actually we can limit the the blast radius and the impact that we'd be seeing and uh, that that type of event occur. And then more importantly, we'll move on to some some questions at, at the end of the session as, as well. So um, without any further ado, let's have a look at um, our first poll that we want to just get here. And so Tom's going to just push up this, uh, this slide. If you can log into Slido, uh, details are, are there on the on the side of the screen. And just interested to understand how confident are you that your organization's current controls are robust enough to protect against ransomware? And there's a couple of options there that you can choose the, the one that most fits your organization. Um, the poll is uh, anonymous in terms of the percentages that are going to get picked up. So you don't don't be concerned on that one. And um, we're going to leave this to run for a few seconds, just to let everybody have an opportunity to that wants to to log in and actually cast cast their vote. So my screen is showing we've got 39 attendees, uh, so we're going to let it run for a bit to get the numbers of votes in the top right corner, hopefully somewhat closer to 39 than six. So please uh, do log in, slido.com and 70-cyber. Uh, we'll ping the results up when we get to a sort of a sensible mass or the rate of increase starts to slow down. So we'll just give it uh, perhaps 30 seconds. So it feels a bit like a game show. Fast fingers are required here. Thank you for engaging. Uh, generally makes things a bit more, uh, got a bit more skin in the game if you're if you're taking part in this. It is anonymous, I should hasten to add. We're just going to see some bar charts with percentage votes uh, against each of the options here. So uh, we're uh, approaching 50% of you. Thank you for those who've, who've submitted your vote. You're only allowed one vote, I'm afraid. Um, 
holding at 14. I'm feeling David we could uh, we could unveil and see what what it looks like. Any late votes you'll see them dancing up and down on the screen as we go forward. Yeah, more than happy. Let's uh, here we go. Oh, Showing the, the last few votes. Fantastic. That's good. That's probably expected. You know, a good 50% of the audience pretty confident that they have what they need in place. 18% is reducing. Don't know. That's always good, and that's probably why you're here on the call, which is superb. So that's fantastic. Um, we'll let those uh, results sort of trickle in. Um, what we'll do now is we'll move on to the next part. Uh, and, the, and what you're not the, seeing on the bottom of the screen, David, is that oh, we've had one vote for very confident. So it's quite an interesting one. OK, right, I'll turn, switch them yeah. off. Yeah, if you can capture those numbers later. Yeah, absolutely, capture those ones later. Thank you very much, Tom. So uh, without any further uh, waiting around, I want to talk you through the cyber threat landscape from um, very much from my perspective um, and to give you an insight into to how this all hangs together. I tend to articulate this through using this pyramid. So the idea here is that at the bottom of the pyramid where it's it's largest, that is the the, the most voluminous types of attack um, that we see going on across the internet and at that level it's the least amount of technical ability that you need to have that effect and as we move up the pyramid we are reducing the population of individuals that have the skill set required to deliver that level of attack um, but their um, ability is increased but the volume of, of that population is decreasing and how does that look in reality so Basically, right at the bottom, it should be no surprise to anyone. You know, we're talking about worms, viruses, and, and automated attacks. So this is the noise of just having um, connectivity to the internet, being on the internet, having websites on the internet, publicly facing services, IP addresses. This is what you would be expected to see in your uh, logs from your firewalls, from your antivirus. Um, this is just going on. It's the noise. It's part of being on the internet, and it's probably the least amount of skilled activity that we see because it's requiring very rigid scripting to say if I find this condition exploited with with this vulnerability and if there's any nuance that needs to be put in at that level it, it won't work and this is why we see lots and lots of scams um, over, over, the, over the internet and this is why we have firewalls and patching and endpoint protection in place to defend primarily against this level of attack. As we move up we're then moving into the more what I would refer to as the script here, these end of the spectrum. So this is uh, a malicious actor that is looking to cause some form of, of impact, but they don't have any real coding capability, understanding of how the exploits work. They are totally reliant on somebody else's code and hard work that they just take and they fire it back out and they're hoping for the best. Now, in the main, uh, script kiddie attacks at this level are often, um, I would say, categorised as being opportunistic in nature. Uh, they will be looking for a flaw in a technology that they've got a working exploit for, and then just searching the internet for where they can land that exploit. And then once they've done that and it works, what can they do with the access they've gained? So they're very unlikely, but obviously there's always edge cases and, and you know unique instances in all of this. They're very much looking at the technology first, not you as an organization first, so they won't be targeting you and then finding out what floor you have. They will be just throwing these um, and they're making use of a lot of the automated attack end of the spectrum. They're just throwing that out and seeing what lands. If the exploit doesn't work, then actually they're going to blame the exploit, not themselves for throwing it at the wrong technology. Uh, and we see a lot of attacks where uh, Windows based machines are being ex um, targeted by uh, Linux and Unix based um, vulnerabilities, which is never going to work, um, which clearly shows that there's some some degree of uh, <laughs> not understanding the, the environment they're trying to attack. Um, and they're also unable to change the scripting. You know, they, they are controlled and constrained by the exploit that they've been given. Um, we then moving up have frameworks. So frameworks are uh, much more complex um, systems and settings uh, and capabilities for an attacker. So this will be a bunch of different exploit payloads, um, scanning payload, enumeration, how to, once you've gained a foothold, how to maintain access to that environment for persistence, how to then move your attack inside the organization and gain the best effect. Frameworks exist on both sides of the fence in terms of malicious actors, but also uh, as security professionals, we use a lot of frameworks to deliver our security testing as well. So they're very powerful. 
but you still need to know how to use them and get the most out of them. So they tend to be beyond the abilities of a script kitty to actually inter interact with a framework, but the framework still delivers set exploits and set payloads and set processes that you then bolt together to make it work. But again, you're constrained by what's inside that framework and the tooling that you've been given at that point. So again, it allows you to be a bit more uh, targeted, but in the main, you're still looking for opportunistic attacks against a technology stack. Moving up into skilled attackers phase. So skilled attackers, we're getting into the rounds where somebody can actually take existing exploit scripts and they can tweak them to work in an environment that they are actually trying to target or a particular flavor of technology that it needs some work to make it work. So they're not constrained by the script as much as the script kiddie would be. Uh, and they're much better at, at manually exploiting vulnerabilities that they are, they are coming across. Differentiator here between that and targeted highly skilled is that in that bracket, we're talking more about organized crime at this level. Targeted highly skilled in my book is where they are going after a goal um, as their motivation. So either they are specifically targeting an organization or they are looking to affect some form of monetary payout and therefore they're very keen on how that's running, making it work for them and, and leveraging technology to their advantage to, to gain that. So serious and organized crime groups, certainly at that level. And the differentiator between that and skill attack, as I said, is the targeted nature. They're probably going after an organization rather than just scattergun approach and hoping that something lands. And then finally, the dreaded zero day. You know, there are very few people uh, in that in the population that can actually find a, a brand new vulnerability that has never been discovered before, does not have a patch to defend against it, write the exploit code that is required to deliver it and make it work. But when they do, it has the most devastating uh, effect and, and we've all seen the, the impact of, of zero day exploits being used. And we see a lot of those being used by um, sort of as a that nation state and serious organized crime end of the spectrum where they are using that to their advantage to gain that initial foothold. Now, the important thing to take away from this slide is that the further up the stack you are, you've got more of a playground to play in. You can, if you're at the top end of this where you're creating zero days, it doesn't mean that you're going to do that. You will take the path of least resistance. So if I can throw an automated attack at an organization and it's going to work and I get in, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take the path of least resistance to achieve my, my aim. I'm not going to make my life difficult by creating some exotic uh, exploit um, payload that's never existed before. So you can then obviously play anywhere in that in that uh, environment. The other thing to be to be mindful of is that when a zero day or a brand new exploit comes out. Over time, it becomes more available to the lower level, so it will be refined, becomes available to the highly skilled and skilled attackers. It will then find itself in a framework, eventually script kiddies will start getting hold of bespoke exploit scripts that they can just run, and then it finally ends up at the automated attack end of the uh, of the of the world. And this used to take in the past several months, but we have seen instances of new zero days coming out, and within 72 hours, we're seeing them being run as automated uh, attacks. So that lead time into them becoming more available to a wider population is definitely shortening over time. So that's probably the key takeaway um, on, on that, and which is why patching is such a vital activity, because obviously the longer you leave that service exposed, you are finding that the ability to exploit that becomes easier and easier and easier over time, and all of these other parts of the population can then start picking that up and targeting you. So ransomware threat landscape, there's a couple of stats here that I just want to, to sort of let you guys see key one here is you know sort of the average ransom in the uk being north of 135,000. Uh, that was from the uh, current sophos report on the state of ransomware in 2022 um, they brought this in as a dollar base figure i don't like dollars because we're in the uk so let's talk about pounds we've just converted it and that's, uh, that's a rough calculation of the number that they were working with um, i think the important thing here to know with some of these stats is that you know, it is big business for organized crime gangs and skilled attackers and opportunistic attack attackers to, to make use of. And it is very much money driven. They are trying to extort money out of you as an organization, and that's what their, their aim is. Um, you know, there is some key parts here, you know, with the fact that, you know, impact on your ability to operate, loss of business revenue, being able to get back data um, is, is an interesting uh, point. There is a lot of initiatives out there that you can actually approach to try and, if if the 
encrypting code is obtained from the ransomware gang through either uh, Interpol or other means of rolling over the, the organized crime group and getting access to the code, then people are writing decryptors off the back of it. So sometimes something that wasn't able to be decrypted without paying the ransom a little while ago can suddenly become available. So it's always keep, worth keeping an eye on that. Um, but the, equally here, you know, the percentage of 4% of organizations that paid a ransom recover all of their encrypted data. Um, that opens up interesting uh, ethical conversations about should we be funding organized criminal activity through paying a ransomware and actually a lot of organizations that do pay the ransom uh, don't get all of their data back then they get some of it back they're opening themselves up to further extortion and also they're, they're putting a mark on them that they're actually willing to pay ransom and, and we have seen evidence of a repeat uh, compromise of, of organizations even though they've paid a, a ransom because they've not worked out what the initial attack vector was and they've left themselves exposed and i think also to be quite mindful of in, in in the threat landscape from ransomware is again very much the same as the pyramid on the previous page we have different levels of ability we have at the lower end of the spectrum that script kiddie side of, of life it's a smash and grab they will try and probably throw a malicious spreadsheet in or a malicious word doc or pdf into an organization hope somebody clicks on it and it is able to run on the machine that they've targeted and then it will start encrypting um, information as soon as that's been been opened and we definitely see that we also see some very targeted attacks at the top end of the spectrum um, and then in between the two there's a lot of framework use so people uh, there is right, so ransomware as a service it, there's an entire ecosystem around this where you've got organized crime groups that build and maintain frameworks that enable lower skilled people to go out and target organizations. Once they've gained some form of compromise, they're then given a run book. They're told what to do in that environment and the steps that they should take to the point where they do encrypt data and to move them away from this smash and grab approach. So it is compromising the entire environment. It's becoming domain admin and environments. They control everything. It is laterally moving through all of the environment to get access to as much of the network as they can before they then through the, the ransomware in, mix, into the mix. But at that point, what they're doing is once all the data is encrypting, they're handing that relationship off to the owner of the framework and the organized crime group. They've done their part in the in the puzzle. They hand it off and it's then the ransom demand and the negotiation is done at a higher level. And, and so it's definitely more organized uh, and, and efficient. And they are then hopefully going to get a payout from the organized crime gang for bringing that 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 revenue stream in which i think is quite an interesting one where you're you have malicious actors relying on other malicious actors to be good natured individuals and actually pay the money that they've promised to pay so it's an interesting trust relationship within that within that world so that brings us on quite nicely to today's uh, main focus which is us running through an incident that we actually managed uh, you'll see on the bottom of the slide there is a link to a, a blog that goes into the nature of the malware that was used as part of the ransomware attack in much more detail so please feel free to go and read that if that is of, of interest and i think before i go into this timeline so the blue bar is going to represent time and we're going to look at how the attack manifested over over a period of time and i'm going to talk to you about what the malicious actors were doing within the environment at different stages of their attack but what i want you to remember um, at this point is we came into this incident after the event so the client the first thing that they knew was at four o'clock in the morning their uh, main sys system administrator uh, the manager of the network was called to say things were not working within the business anymore because machines had gone offline and access to resources had failed he was very quick to understand that actually he was looking at encrypted um, data and therefore it was a ransomware attack and we got the call to come in and help at the end of this so we are coming into this after it has all occurred and we're trying to unpick how it's happened when it happened where it happened and the whys and wherefores of this so what you're going to get here is a very clean and sensible logical time-based approach but at the time we're presented with a with an environment that's just chaotic and we're actually unpicking all of that so um, you probably won't get a flavor for just how chaotic that, that part of the incident uh, was and hopefully none of you end up at that same level so what did we find out? So initial compromise in this client's network was actually 9 p.m. at night on the 13th of February. 
obviously a previous year because we're only in January today. When we unpacked what was going on and we did our incident response activity and looked at how the malicious actors were moving through the network, we were able to backtrack a lot of the activity and piece together the breadcrumb trail that brought us back to the machine that was actually compromised first and foremost. And the attack was actually, it started off at the sort of that lower end of the spectrum, that smash and grab type of approach of an automated attack. And what it was, was a malicious invoice had been sent in to the organization into a um, accounts mailbox. Now the organization receives hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of invoices a day because of the nature of their business. So they had an automated piece of software that would automatically open all attachments coming into the accounts mailbox and send them to a printer for a print job. So when the accounts team came in in the morning, that day's work was already printed out for them to go and follow on with their business processes. Unfortunately, in this instance, the unpacking of that uh, malicious attached invoice triggered um, a malware to be downloaded to that, that machine. The malware was able to run and gain a foothold on that, uh, that PC within this environment. And it was basically um, part of the right ransomware family, which we'll, we'll sort of look at as we go through. But they used a couple of um, strands of malware, so Emotet and Trickbot, which are, are well known to anybody that's been following any ransomware uh, activity. And that basically command and controls that machine. It, it allows the malicious actors to gain access to that machine and use it as a launch pad to move around the rest of, of the network, keep coming in out of that machine if they, if they see fit. Now, between the 13th and 26th of February, the malicious actors are doing nothing overt to try and trigger attention to themselves so they're not encrypting any data at this stage what they're doing is they're actually mapping out the network because they do not know what they've gained access to they don't know how the topology of the network works what it's also connected to and what other environments they can gain um, access to so they're enumerating they're scanning and they're moving around the network and they were actually using rdp um, so they stole credentials from that initial machine and those credentials were valid to move around the network and they're also looking to gain other credentials as they move through to gain more privileges and therefore have a wider reaching impact on the internal network and you could see them jumping from machine to machine using rdp and a lot of the logs that we were looking at we could piece together this timeline of which machines they were on at, at what point which is part of the way we worked back to that initial uh, machine being compromised and at this point they're just getting an understanding of what they've got access to and, and how much of the network have they actually covered. We could also see evidence of them getting confused. So they would actually, some machines had two network addresses and they were then RDPing back to themselves because they didn't understand that that machine had those two addresses. And so you could see them getting themselves a little bit confused as they're mapping it out, which was always uh, a bit interesting to see that they, they're definitely learning as they go. But a lot of the tooling that they're using at this point is common tooling that we would see from a, a red team or a security testing um, activity. It's nothing exotic or, or clever at this stage. It's port scanning, it's enumeration, it's stealing credentials, and it is using those to, to move around the network. Now, also during this period of time, we also saw data theft. So pretty much the data theft happened pretty instantaneously. You know, from that initial machine that they compromised, we saw evidence of them taking data off that machine, but that also persisted and they were taking data out of different parts of the network as they were moving um, through that. And that was making use of the Emotet and TrickBot functionality that's built in. It's built to be able to steal data and, and we were able to, to, to fundamentally follow that and um, more importantly, unpack some of the data that was actually stolen. And one of the things to bear in mind here is that obviously we're building towards the focus being on the ransom and we're brought in at the end where a customer's got a business impacting event because they can't access their data but part of our challenge is to work out well what else was going on as well is it just ransomware that's been thrown in straight away or in this case as we can see there's been an, an elapsed period of time so what have the malicious actors been doing in that that network and then when we could see evidence of data being extracted it was an analysis of the data that was actually taken to inform the businesses to their exposure and uh, and thankfully in this instance it was business related data so they didn't have an ico reporting requirement for loss of pii or personal information so that was that was good because they could make an informed decision as not to go to the to the information commission in terms of a reportable breach but it did change the relationship of they then had customer comms to go out to to explain and position with other other customers um, and a lot of it was then used on the 16th of feb to actually try and attack the business partners of this organization so the data they use they 
that they they stole they used to create templates for emails to go out to uh, other supply chain members of that organization and that actually allowed them to to attempt to onward compromise other environments to see if they could repeat the process again and it's a term that we we often use in this part of the industry which is rinse and repeat if it's worked for you once somewhere you try it again elsewhere and you just keep repeating that process and then rolling over more organizations as you go and then finally the ransomware wasn't deployed until the 27th of February and it was actually deployed at uh, eight o'clock at night. That's quite common. A lot of the time when they're going to throw that final mix in, which is that ransomware being deployed and starting to encrypt all of the data, that encryption process takes time and it has to be deployed onto all of the machines that you're wanting to to encrypt all of the shared drives, all of the data stores that you found. That's why that mapping of the network and understanding where you want to go and drop that ransomware encryptor is quite important because you want to get as much coverage as you can from a malicious actor's point of view. And they want it to run as long as possible before somebody notices. So it, it, more often than not, if you're dealing with more of an organized element, they will do that a X number of days after they've gained compromise and they've done everything they want to do leading up to it. But equally, they'll do it in an evening because they know people will not be looking and it's going to be likely to be the next working day that they see the activity has, has occurred. And that's funny enough why you'd expect some of this to happen at uh, holiday periods. You know, we've seen a lot of attacks on the last working day of a, of a period, a Friday as well is always a, a classic one for this being being kicked off. So you may not find it until the Monday morning and it's had the massive amount of opportunity to move around your network. Um, and in this case, that's exactly what they, they did. They dropped the ransomware and crypto across the, the estate and it caused a, a massive amount of impact to the business in terms of encrypting the data that they, they needed to do their, their day job. But as I said, part of us was walking it backwards and actually seeing what else had they done in that environment and seeing that they've actually stolen data. That data was business um, related and then being used to onward compromise the, the supply chain of this particular customer. Um, so as you can see here, you've got quite a window of um, you know, 13th to the 27th of Feb where they've been inside the network doing what they want to do before the ransomware has actually become the thing that you have become uh, aware of. We've also seen uh, evidence where the individuals that are responsible for that initial compromise and moving around the network and doing the data theft are different to the people that then deliver the ransomware. So somebody has sold access to that environment after they finished with it. You know, they're not interested in the ransomware side. They've just gone in, compromised the environment, stolen data to use for whatever other purposes that they are then going to use that for. Sometimes it's selling it on the dark web for, for the money or for then more highly targeted attacks elsewhere, or they were actually just purely interested in the sensitive information that you as a business have um, that can be used against you or in, in support of your um, you know, your competitors. And then they just hand it off to a ransomware actor to, to do the final um, part. And in fact, we've even we've seen that we've seen competing ransomware actors on the same network where they've clearly everybody's brought access and we've had three or four different actors with different flavors of ransomware all basically trying to land grab and be the ones that are in control of the environment. And all they end up doing is encrypting each other's um, uh, payloads and, and ransom notes. So it's a bit more of a, they're infighting amongst themselves, but you as a business still have, have the impact. So moving on to mitigation. Um, this is from um, NCSC, which is a fantastic resource for any size of organization that you're dealing with. I would definitely point you towards uh, NCSC as, as a good independent repository for good well thought through advice and guidance and they've got a lot of detailed advice and guidance around mitigating malware uh, and certainly ransomware attacks which seems to be the, the biggest flavor of that um, and they're quite right there is no complete way to protect your organization it is about defense in depth and layering up how you defend your organization and the, the purpose of that is you're, you're trying to make it hard to get into your organization in the first place and unfortunately there's a bit of a well i just need to make it harder to attack me than somebody else and therefore they'll go for somebody else type of approach but you are looking after yourself in this in this way so you need to make sure that you're the harder person to attack and therefore likely to deflect going somewhere else but equally there is no 100 percent protection so if they do get into your organization then you need to be able to disrupt what they're up to make it likely that they're going to trigger something that allows you to see that they're already inside and doing the that preamble that you know that network enumeration and working through your network before they get to the ransomware stage 
Um, and as I said uh, the, um, earlier in terms of the threat landscape, the playbooks that some of these organised crime gangs are giving to the lower skilled individuals that are trying to affect the ransom, they are told quite clearly in that playbook when to deploy. And there's a whole stages of trying to become domain admin, trying to map out the entire network, trying to identify backups and delete the backups before they do the deployment of, of ransom. So there's a whole load of things that they're trying to educate those malicious actors to do before they get to the ransomware stage. If you can spot that happening at that, that part and take them out of your network, then clearly you are limiting the impact of, of the ransom uh, being deployed within that environment. So what are some of the key things in this um, mitigation layers? So should be no surprise, multi-factor authentication. You know, the, the advice is still there that we should be enabling MFA. It's not a silver bullet. It's not the panacea that's going to cure everything. It's a disruptor because there are ways to get around MFA, but it adds that extra layer of technical um, difficulty for an, att an attacker to actually leverage an account that they gained access to. Regular backups, um, offline backups, cold storage. You, know, you need to think about these things at the stage of um, if you just have a backup on your network, the malicious actors are really good at finding that as part of that enumeration phase. And I've seen evidence of uh, large scale backups just being not even encrypted because it would just take too long to encrypt them. So they just destroy the availability and the integrity of that data. They just get rid of it off the network. So we've seen um, an entire uh, SAN drive was was the, the at a file system level. The entire thing was locked using BitLocker technology that was already existing on the machine. They just applied a very complex passcode. You're never going to get around that. We've also seen um, massive multi terabyte SANs being the whole um, mirrored file system just being destroyed. So you don't have access to the to the backup. Bridge patching, I can't stress how important this one is. You've seen from that threat landscape, you know, as the longer you leave yourself exposed to a vulnerability that has been identified, the easier it is for attackers to make use of that over time. And it becomes much more likely that that would be a compromise. And we're still seeing networks today when we're coming in to do our security assessments with quite critical security vulnerabilities dating back to you know, 2019, 2017, in some cases that we can exploit to gain complete control of that environment. So um, th those should not be in existence. Um, and looking at malware protection, so endpoint protection is a is a good disruptor. It's not the panacea again, because the, we just need to work out what malware protection you've got in place and work around that. So again, it's a disruptive layer and a and a challenge to the attacker, but it's not, not going to be the panacea again on any of this. And none, none of it should be. However, um, there's further mitigation to consider. You know, strong passwords. Yeah, we are educating people to move towards the three random words um, solution. It is definitely a much more robust position to be in than trying to come up with a an eight or nine character complex passwords with with exclamation marks and hashes and and capitals and and numbers. Three random words is much more effective in in providing a strong password. Phishing awareness, um, absolutely get your team to be aware of what a malicious link looks like, how to try and be critical about things that are challenging them to try and do something quickly and probably against their judgment. Uh, evaluate your intrusion detection, make sure that it actually can spot um, this activity at an earlier stage. Network segmentation is very useful. You know, certainly I've said you know, in that attack, they were moving around the network using RDP. So consider not enabling internal RDP or certain parts of the network you can't jump into. Audit your access controls. The evidence of these happening and occurring are there to be seen. If anybody has been looking at the um, access uh, logs uh, within the environment of that case study, you'd have seen it occurring. Red team exercises, super useful. Um, emulating the attacker and what can an attacker do and testing your defences and giving you the heads up as where attacks could be leveraged and, and where we could get to means that you can then take um, mitigating uh, actions to, 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 to get rid of those in advance. It is worth knowing that you know, according to the cyber reason survey, you know, the average cost of remediation is around 800,000. Uh, I'd agree with that. I, I've been involved in some very big um, remediation uh, efforts where the number is scarily much larger than that. Um, average time to remediate a month. I think that's it can be conservative. I've seen massive impact on organisations where it's taken six plus months to actually get back to the business actually working as it was before the event. Um, and an interesting stat of 84% you know, of organisations that pay the ransomware uh, were, were hit again. And this comes back to the need 
to identify how they got into your organization. If you can't identify that and mitigate that, you are leaving yourself exposed to uh, a repeat infection. If you do or don't pay the ransom, you know, because if that if that vulnerability is now known and is being leveraged, there is no reason for it not to be um, to be targeted again. Um, we're going to ask one more poll at this point. So that should be coming up on your screens. Um, uh, again, it's the slido.com if you're not logged in already. Uh, and the 70 hyphen cyber is the event code for this. We've taken off the hiding the results thing, so it's going to be live. Uh, again, it's completely anonymous. Worked on the percentage basis there and we're off. So we've I can see on my screen we've got 45 attendees, so it'd be great to get 50% of you at least to fast fingers voting here. Fundamentally, it's the same question. How confident are you now that your organization's controls are robust enough to protect you on the basis of what David's uh, been describing? If I can just adver advertise the, the Q&A, um, please do pose any questions you've got arising uh, from David's presentation in, in the Q&A department, and I'll be sifting through those and, and uh, corralling that at the end of the um, presentation. So we got votes from about a, just under a third of you. Thank you. Um, pretty confident is, is, is high scoring at the minute, which is great. See if we can nudge it to 20 in the next few seconds and then we'll uh, draw a halt there. Well, as we pass 20, David, it might be worth noting that we're nearly past 10 20. Um, pretty confident number is, on the first go was uh, was 53 percent. We're nudging it to 63, of course. One vote on, on 20 has the capacity to nearly shift it by 5%. So uh, we'll see where we go. Don't know is still the, the, the number two score out there. Uh, more people don't know than, than did it to start with. And um, the not very confident figure remains the same. So I think um, fundamentally we've not shifted the needle here, but uh, but there we go. I can press pause on that if you fancy. Yeah, I think we're moving to about five minutes left to go, so we'll move on to the questions to give, give an opportunity to, to people. Um, but as you're thinking about questions, just to give some signposting as to what next, um, we've actually got some business resilience roadshows that are coming up, um, Leeds, London and, and Warwick. If um, any of you would like to attend in person to those events, you can book online. Um, redcentricplc.com um, is, is the place to go and also your uh, account managers can signpost that for you um, and if you want to follow up in any of this please do do get in touch with the team so I think at that point it's probably good it'd be interesting if there are any questions from, from the audience on what we've covered today so what we're what we're getting a little bit David of relates to the horny old subject of cyber insurance uh, mm -hmm. And if I can summarise the sort of sentiment we're getting here, effectively, do you need to worry about the cyber threats that you've just described if you have cyber insurance? Yeah, I think that's a, that's actually a really good question. Um, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. So I'm a firm believer of, of cyber insurance has a role to play in an organisation's approach to resilience and also enabling them to manage their risk exposure. I think it's probably worth noting a few points though. Uh, one, we are seeing a trend of uh, insurance organisations have made clear statements to market that they are looking at ways to move away from protecting ransomware exposures that currently is provided within a lot of these insurance products. So insurers are maturing in, in their understanding of the risk and their, their exposure. The underwriting process that they are going through for organisations is becoming way more robust and challenging to organisations to prove that they're in a stage where they can actually 
be accepted as a risk to the to the underwriter. So organizations are being asked to, to do a lot more work up front to prove that they are robust enough to be insured to limit the insurance liability. Um, but we are also seeing um, organizations that don't read the small print. So and, and a lot of the uh, insurance documentation it will it outline your requirements as a business for it to be a legitimate um, insurance claim. And that is having robust patch management. It is running the latest firmware. It is running the latest uh, vulnerability um, scanning definitions in your environment, running the latest antivirus definitions on your endpoint controls. Um, and then what's actually happening is, and we've seen real instances of this occurring on, on client environments, the insurers will send out their own technical resource to you in the guise of supporting your incident. But actually their primary role is to look at evidence on the environment that you met the requirements of the insurance um, and therefore do they actually have to pay out. Um, so that that is quite concerning where I would expect a technical resource that's being deployed to be working with you to understand the size and nature of the vulnerability and, and help do those steps. As we said, how bad it is, is it? what was the root cause for getting in to stop it from happening again but actually if they're there to be to be motivated to look at the patch status of particular machines and antivirus definition dates to try and find that you weren't uh, covered that's going to have a massive impact on an organization and being able to then invoke the business continuity you know the continuation clauses in there which are going to help them you know get over this so i think it's a it's an interesting double-edged uh, sword on that one uh, and one of the comments in in the questions David uh, observes that actually insurance expect excesses uh, are rising uh, and then actually the premium in itself is is increasing in its expense yeah no totally I think the the, the days of the insurance company that they, they saw it as a um, market opportunity uh, without really understanding the nature of the the risk they were getting involved in so the big insurance companies are going to mature and they're there to make money for their you know, their organization and, and the underwriters so at the end of the day they will de-risk where they can and part of that is a making it harder to to get the cover uh making it harder to claim once you have the cover but also increasing the premium to cover these these cases when it um, when it does actually does does land terrific well thank you for that uh next question um uh, what if any ransomware attacks are designed for uh, microsoft uh, 365 SharePoint or OneDrive, uh, are there vulnerabilities in that Microsoft space, David? Yeah, that's actually quite an interesting, that's an emerging area that's sort of becoming a bit more um, interesting. So we're seeing cases where obviously with the credentials that somebody gains access to, they are looking to see what data they can get access to with. OneDrive SharePoint folders are definitely coming part of that mix. Um, it's primarily at the moment we've seen a lot more of those areas being used for data theft rather than the um, encryption of, of those directly. But that's definitely an area that we're that, that's moving quite rapidly. So I'd say watch this space over the next six to 12 months as that becomes a bit more of a, a, a pinch point for customers. So just because you have things in Microsoft um, land does not necessarily um, protect them. What we do find is Microsoft has a very robust uh, mechanism for spotting malicious files that sit within those environments So using it to propagate and run encryption um, malware from is, is, is still difficult, but not impossible. Uh, but no, certainly data theft from and, and um, deletion of those files is, is a problem. Um, so a lot of organizations are looking at how do they do additional backups of Office 365 based data. Terrific. Um, a, a couple of the other questions related to specific points, which I think I've been able to sort of uh, take out on the um, on the chat function here. Uh, those that was it on the, the questions that have come in. If you've got any last questions, folks, please do get them in. Otherwise, I, I think we'll probably be wrapping up. Um, very tight presentation, David. I think you, you've hit the timings bang on. Uh, <laughs> in terms of, sort of we'll be done in 45 minutes. Uh, so there we are. Um, we'll give it a couple more seconds uh, for questions. But if not, David, I'll hand back to you to wrap up. 
No, perfect. I think I've got nothing further to add. Um, thank you for listening today. Hopefully that was a quick canter through the, the world of, of threat actors and ransomware. Um, and I said, I'm more than happy to follow up with individuals um, outside of this as, as needed. But uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it today and um, talk more as needed. Thank you all. And uh, we aim to send uh, a link to a recording of this session uh, to you after the event if you'd like it. Thanks very much.